Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Angelica Das. I am with the Public Square team at Democracy Fund, and I was able to serve on the advisory committee for today's event. It's a special privilege to introduce this particular panel um, for a number of reasons for me personally, reframing, reclaiming, and preserving black narratives. This discussion brings to center the overwhelming vitality, power, and strength of the past, present, and future of black stories. Our moderator is Tara Roberts. National Geographic Storytelling Fellow and host and executive producer of Into the Depths podcast. She is joined by an extraordinary panel um, who are all ensuring these stories thrive. Thank you all for being here. Right. Hello. <laughs> Glad to be here, guys. Yeah. <laughs> nice to be here. Yeah. So I am meeting Angela for the first time today, but I have had the pleasure to hang out in some exotic locales around the world with Mary and Kamal. And I think this is our next exotic locale, the headquarters of National Geographic. So it's great to be here. Um, I want to start with you, Mary. <laughs> so you are a museum specialist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and you curated the Slavery and Freedom exhibit that takes up three whole floors. Um, if you guys have not been to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, go. It is an incredible place, full of stories, stories from a black perspective that span from the 15th century all the way to current day. So that's just a little plug, go. <laughs> um, but Mary, I would love for you to just say why you think it's so important that that place exists and why you think it's important that it exists here in Washington, D.C. Well, thank you so much, Tara. And um, I'm the curator of American slavery, and I co-curated with my colleague, Nancy Burkhaw. And so the history gallery, which, you know, thank you so much for bringing that up, starts with slavery and freedom, which is on the lowest level and um, includes segregation and a changing America. So it takes us all the way through to today. And it's really foundational to telling the stories that flow as you continue to go up. The importance about the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture is really bringing um, the African American perspective, the voice to the public arena. I just talked about this the other day um, when we talked about the importance of the Lincoln Memorial and the anniversary, the 100th anniversary, and the fact that black people have always brought our voice to the public arena since as early as the colonial period. But really, this allows us to tell the story of the nation through the African-American lens. And so when I say that to people, I always tell them that lens looked out onto a diverse world. So it's not just enslaved black people and planter elite. It's enslaved black people, it's free people of color, it's indigenous people in bondage and free. It's also poor white people, yeoman white farmers and planter elite during that period. But we also talk about human suffering and the power of the human spirit. We talk about profit and power juxtaposed against the human cost. And we talk about how people of African descent in the world and African Americans in the nation shaped the landscape and were shaped by the landscape, socially, politically, economically, culturally, intellectually, and even spiritually. It's very important to be able to share these stories from the African American perspective because for so long our voices have been erased. And one would think that we didn't contribute to the development of the nation, that people of African descent weren't significant to the development of the Atlantic world, but it was due to our labor and the sale of our bodies that brought the Atlantic world into being and the nation into being. And in addition to our labor and the sell of our bodies, we contributed to the dialogue about slavery and freedom. 
One could say even just in our mere presence, laws were being made just by us being here. We didn't have to say a thing, but we did. From the very beginning, we did. And it's important for people to know that. And also to keep in mind that a story can be told from a bill of sale. A story can be told from a ledger. Because when someone enters that Susie had a baby, and then two years later, Susie's baby is sold. And then two years later, Susie dies. That's Susie's story. And someone goes and does the research and finds out how she came to be in this place. Did she have a faith system? Well, we know she had family. Did she suffer? Did she have moments of joy? It's important for us to tell this very human story. I always love talking to you and learning from you. Mastermind over here. So. Um, Thank you for this. And I think one of the stories that you've told me that's been most impactful and that's opened my eyes um, in ways that I didn't know that they were closed was understanding the impact of the transatlantic slave trade. That was one of the most monumental events in history, but the way that we talk about it is as a side note in our history books. So I thought it could be really helpful for you to contextualize the trade and help us understand how world changing it actually was. Um, and then help us see what we lose as a society by not understanding its impact fully. OK, well, I'll st let me think about when you go into the entrance of the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition. We start with the film. And that film has images that were drawn by people of European descent during the period. And so what we had to do was shift the viewer's gaze to think from the perspective of a person of African descent. So we have quotes from people from the period and from griots and observers who reflected on the landscape. This is where I was born. This is what it was like. Um, because we wanted people to see that the Africa is a continent made up of diverse people, cultures, intellects, societies, governmental organizations, um, skills, resources, universities. And as you make your way down the hall, you learn about the jurisdictions significant to the, the slave trade that impacted North, the development of North America, but also the rest of the world. So we look at regions in West Africa and in Europe. And then we go through and we talk about trade and that these groups met as equal, even equals, even though they were already engaged in the world stage. There were diplomats already out in the world even before the transatlantic slave trade took hold. People of African descent already out in the world. But we talk about this particular moment, how they come to be um, during that mid 15th century and there was already slavery in the world, including in Africa, but there was a difference. It wasn't, it wasn't chattel slavery. So I could enslave you, um, you're Mende, I'm Igbo, we get into warfare, I could treat you differently than I would treat my own people. But guess what? He could move up in society. Right? And his children wouldn't inherit his status. So yes, that existed. But the transatlantic slave trade was commercialized and racialized. And the other thing for people to understand is during the period Europe, the notion of otherness. So the, the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Catholic Church kicking Jewish people and Moors as they were considered out of the region, right? Based on this need for pure blood. So there's this sense of otherness in the world. You see these two groups come together. You see trade continue in goods, including in people. And then ultimately, the Atlantic world opens up. The Western Atlantic world opens up. And you see this drive for profit going towards that Western Atlantic world, seeing the possibilities for plantation development and that need for sugar, the drive for sugar, unlike cotton during the antebellum period. And so you see all these people putting, being put into the transatlantic slave trade, and you see all these nation states making money off of what's being produced in the Western Atlantic world, but also the people being shipped across the Atlantic. At any given moment, and I'm sure Kamal will speak about this as well, at any given moment you see along that Western African coastline, people talk about going to Elmina, 
to visit for heritage tourism. There were tons of these trade forts along that coastline. And at any given moment, it was under the, the leadership of the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, the British. English. English, thank you, making money, making all kinds of money, hand over fist, and then that human cost juxtaposed against that profit. And it brought those nation states into being. In the exhibition, we have a token. It's the Guinea token that has the stamp of the elephant and castle, which represents the English creating this. It's actually the currency that signifies the trade in gold and people in that Guinea area. But then you also see the plantation token, the Barbados penny, with the bust of an African man enslaved and underneath it says, I serve. And it speaks volumes to what was going on in the world and how hand over fist this message is being delivered that slavery was okay. And it was bringing all of this, the Atlantic world colonies and those European nation states into being. And it was foundational for the founding of the nation. All the money that was made, the people who cleared the land, the people who labored for folks to be able to sit down and write the Declaration of Independence. It's foundational to the founding of this nation. And so it's important for people to understand the role that slavery played. Again, like I said, improving the land, cultivating the land, but the contributions are not limited to our labor. They also include our contributions to the conversation on what is freedom? What is the meaning of freedom? What are we willing to fight for when it comes to freedom, rebellion, and so much more? Awesome. And I, I do want to add, in addition to those nation states, the private companies that were supported by those nation states that also made profit off of that transatlantic slave trade and this enterprise of slavery. So you have people, for example, in Barbados who then extend out to South Carolina and then South Carolina, people who make money and then extend out to Cuba. Even when the illegal trade was going on, people still creating plantations down in Cuba and other areas, which I know um, Kamau is He'll probably speak about it, but you're getting ready to go to Cuba yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great moment, I think, to bring you in, Kamal, to the <laughs> conversation. So you are uh, a lead instructor with Diving with a Purpose, or DWP. Um, that's the organization that we met each other from and yep. has allowed us to visit each other around the world. Uh, you're also on the leadership team of the Slave Works Project, which is a, or it's a, a network of global organizations that um, is hosted by the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And its mission is to help search for and document these slave shipwrecks. So I wanted you to, I think, extend what Mary started to help us see, sort of the global nature of the slave trade by focusing on these ships and the shipwrecks. I bet most people don't really think about the ships or that they wrecked. So maybe you could give us some stats on those ships and tell us what is this work that is happening and who's doing it and why is it important that black people are involved in it? Sure, yeah, Tara, thank you. Thank you for that question. But if I can just take five seconds to express <laughs> how profoundly honored I am to be among these powerful black women right here oh. in the middle. <laughs> 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 yeah. And I also want to state, state publicly for your critical work in that March issue, so thank you. So yes, uh, Diving with the Purpose um, uh, is focused on trying to tell the stories of some 12,000 plus ships that was involved in the trade. That's a tremendous task, right? So out of those 12,000 ships that made some 40 plus thousand voyages, uh, we know of, in terms of location, approximately, approximately 15 or so. Of those, of those 15, we probably have archaeologically documented, um, give the benefit of the doubt, about 10. And I personally dove uh, on five of those. So uh, that work is, is critically important. It adds to the story. Each one of those vessels has a very unique story of its own. And maybe later on I can talk, talk a bit about the Clotilda, which was the last slave ship that came into the U.S. So the DWP got started and, and, and looked at this, this history and said, why isn't this work being done? 
you know? Why are these incredible stories being told? And Mary just so powerfully articulated uh, the human impact of these stories, you know? So we said, well, why don't we just dive with the purpose? I mean, we can dive and see the beautiful coral reef and the beautiful fish and whale sharks and so forth. But there's, there's a mission here. And so we decided to take on that mission to train certified divers how to do underwater archaeological documentation. And that's what we've, we've, we've been about. And so um, I mentioned the Clotilda. Uh, Mary mentioned about to make a trip to Cuba, not specifically for this project, but we know there are some critical vessels around the coast of Cuba. Uh, one of them is the penultimate vessel that brought Africans into this country called the Wanderer. We know approximately where it is. It has an incredible story to tell as well. The Clotilde and the Wanderer came into this country illegally, bringing over 500 individuals who had children, families. These were artisans, mothers, fathers, uncles, griots, priests, uh, so who have told their story. And so we, we want to tell the story of those individuals, not of just the ships. These are powerful artifacts, to say the least. But we want to tell the story of the people that were on those vessels as well, to raise their voices the silent voices that's been quiet for so very long. So. Mm. And why, Kamal, is it important for black people to be involved in that work specifically? Yeah, it's important for us to control the narrative. I mean, we're looking at what's happening today in terms of uh, efforts to um, uh, control information, right? To not make people aware of their heritage, essentially, that it becomes uh, are shameful if you talk about these sort of things and, and the perpetrators, you know, become shameful to them. You know, what's next? Are we going to start closing down museums because, you know, someone, a German walks into the Holocaust Museum and get ashamed? So um, we think it's important for us to be at the forefront of these, of telling the stories, of, of controlling this narrative. Uh, we, we bring a special sort of perspective to it. Uh, and we can sensitize ourselves to these, to these stories as well because this is part of our heritage. You know, we're talking about our ancestral heritage here. And so I think it's critically important that we be a part of that storytelling. Yeah. You mentioned um, that you have participated in five of these missions, and that is not a little thing. I think you are one of the few people who has been a part of that many missions. Um, so that's incredible. And I wanted to ask you, what has it meant for you to actually touch artifacts of this history, of your past? Has it changed you in any way or changed your perspective in any way? If you, if you look real close, I'm getting chill bumps right now, just remembering just remembering some of those experiences. Um, <clears throat> it has changed me profoundly, both physically, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, I remember very clearly my first dive on the South Jose Phuket de Africa, off the coast of Cape Town, South Africa. It was a very beautiful day. The water was calm. And you rarely ever get an opportunity to dive uh, in this location because the water is very turbulent most of the time, and also very cold, about 45 degrees. But uh, I remember that day, and uh, we had a, almost a perfect day, idyllic day, to dive, uh, at least on the surface. When we got down underwater, it was a, kind of a different story. But uh, we dove anyway, and uh, I remember the diver showing us around the site. This is the South Jose crest in, on these rocks, and uh, the water was cold. The visibility was sort of limited because of the surge, and there was a, kelp, a lot of kelp in the environment. But I remember diving and, and coming around the corner of these rocks, and uh, lodged within these rocks was some wooden material. I thought it was from the wreck. I believe it was from the wreck. But we know that the South Jose was carrying some wood from uh, Portugal as well. It left Portugal, was heading to, I'm sorry, it left Mozambique and was heading to uh, Brazil, was stopping off at Cape Town for some provisions. But we turned the corner, I saw this, this wooden member, and uh, it immediately struck me that this is my first visual of a slave ship, an artifact. And so I reached out and I grabbed it, and as soon as I grabbed it, um, 
think whatever you may, but I felt the voices, the reverberation, the energy. I felt the pain and the horror in that piece of wood uh, that reverberated to my body. I couldn't let it go. And I finally released it and, and composed myself and continued the journey. I just came back a few weeks ago from a, another field mission in Alabama on the Clotilde right here in the States. As I mentioned, the Clotilde was the last vessel that brought Africans into this country, 110 Africans. And uh, I had, I've been working on this project for about the you know, past three years or so, but I never really got the opportunity to dive it until a few weeks ago. The, the Clotilde is in the Mobile River, if I can give, paint this picture for you. Uh, the Mobile River is the last place you would want to dive. <laughs> Uh, the water is very muddy. Uh, it wasn't bad. The temperature was around 78 degrees or so, but the visibility is near zero. So I knew I was going to dive this particular vessel under those conditions and be able to reach out and touch it. And so um, I thought about this, and I, I, asked my, I talked to a dear friend of mine, Sabrina Johnson, and she said, well, maybe you should create uh, an ancestral prayer. To, to, uh, before you get into that water so you can really hear the voices of these ancestors. If you, if you, if you don't mind, can I, can I share this with them? Sure. <laughs> yes, it's called uh, Ancestral Prayer for the Clotilde First Dive. Beloved ancestors, your voices have been quiet for 162 years, but your silence ends now. Your voices and memory are lifted now from this wretched vessel, vessel through us, and we welcome you to speak through us. Our connection will never be broken. We are because of you. Thank you for reaching out to us. Blessed to you, spirits of the Clotilde. And so that was recited right before I, I went into the water. And uh, my experience in that water, I don't know, I'm sitting here humbled because I'm probably the only African-American that actually have dove into a hold of a slave vessel where they held our people. The Clotilde is about 80% preserved. It's been preserved in an anaerobic environment. The river is muddy. And so um, this, there's no other specimen like this in, in, in the historical record. So I remember feeling this vessel, zero visibility, feeling my way, feeling my way. And we knew the architecture of the vessel. I got to the bulkhead. It's called the forward bulkhead. And I knew on the other side was the hole where, they, where we held the, the 110 individuals was held. And so as I crawled over and over the gun wall or the side of the, the hull and got into the hole, the river was, there was no current. But once I got over into the hole, I began to tumble. I began to tumble for some reason. And then when I steadied myself, uh, I felt I must have hit something. You know, I felt like a tug on my fin. <laughs> but once I, once I stabilized myself, I felt this incredible embrace, this incredible embrace. And I think it was from, you know, we do the science, we do the archaeology, right? We go in and collect the data, the hard data. But there's another dimension to this. These artifacts have, have a voice. I mean, the data can inform us, but these artifacts, as we engage them, they have a voice as well. So we was braille diving, and as we grab hold of these artifacts, if we listen with our hands, we can hear the other part of that story and what these ancestors are trying to tell us. And so that's, that's the experience I had. It, it, has, it has changed me for the rest of my life, Tara, to say the least. I hadn't heard this story before, Kamau. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I want to um, play a quick clip that shows you in action, and it also has Mary mm -hmm. in it. And um, this is in action around the Sao Jose Paquette de Africa, the ship in Cape Town. So you can see what some of the work is like. So we do maritime archaeology, which enabled us to uncover the Sao Jose. The Sao Jose is a slave ship that starts in Lisbon, travels to Mozambique, picks up captive Africans to sell them into enslavement in Brazil. 
the ship goes down just off the coast of South Africa. What we're doing here is helping to tell a story on human scale, a story about a ship and the 512 people who were enslaved aboard that ship, and the search in all its levels for and around the ship creates deep connections. I do recall very instinctively when I first encountered the wreckage of the South Susan. Being in the water for me, it can become very, very meditative and quiet and beautiful. But when that beauty sort of encapsulated a slave shipwreck, you know, there's another sort of feeling you get. And I just remember seeing that, that wreckage there. And so I approached the wood and I reached out and grabbed it and touched it. And, and whatever you want to call it, I could feel the vibration, the energy, and the pain, and the suffering, and the horror. It's like I kind of closed my eyes and I could audibly hear the, the agony and the scream. If I close my eyes, and all I could think was to say inside my head, we never forgot about you. We came looking for you and we found you. That statement from you, Mary, has stayed with me for so long. It is such an amazing statement to say to the ancestors out there, we didn't forget about you. We came looking for you. I want to get Angela in the conversation, but I just have one, just have to ask you this one question about um, your work is all about looking at history. It's like looking at some of the hardest parts of our history. And I'm just wondering, do you ever have the urge to look away? No. Okay. How do you deal with the trauma and the horrors no. of this work? I never have the desire to look away. And that statement applied to that documentary, but what I was speaking about was when I found my own family where they had fought for the right to vote in Mississippi and they got into a confrontation with the Klan in 1890. It did not work out well for the Klan and my family left by foot and went to Indian Territory and had never returned. I was the first one to go back in 2005. And when I encountered the church where the confrontation between black and white citizens took place and the graveyard, that energy that Kamau speaks of, that's the energy I felt. And the comment I made was on point. It was, I ran out of the car, I ran up to the graveyard, and I closed my eyes and I said, I found you. I found you and you are here and your story's being told. The reason why I don't look away is because I don't know if you all notice this, but my demeanor changes when I talk about this. It's as if someone's whispering in my ear, you're supposed to tell this story. I need you to go out there and tell this story. And I'm not doing this for drama. I'm not doing this to emote. This is what I'm supposed to do. And so when I find a quote that talks about a woman who shoved dirt down her mouth so she would never forget where she came from before she got on that slave ship, for me, when I saw stuff like that, I looked at it and I was like, they need to see this in big gold letters. Yep. And I am never gonna turn away from it because it's our story. And when I say our story, the one thing I didn't list in all those things about our museum is, this is a human story, it's also a shared history. So on a bill of sale, there's an enslaved person, there's a purchaser, and there's a seller. It's all our history. And guess what? My hashtag is run tell that. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. I feel like that needs a Z for nation. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Mary. Um, I have chills listening to you say that. Angela, got to bring you into this conversation. <laughs> okay. 
You are the founder of the Obsidian Collection. Um, much of the way that media approaches our history, it often centers inside of our pain, our, our trauma. Um, you are on a mission to center inside of our power and our strength. I want to play this clip uh, that gives a little more information about the Obsidian Collection. I'm Angela Ford, founder of the Obsidian Collection. The Obsidian Collection is digitizing Black history and making it available for the world to see. There are millions of images in our archives, in our institutions, with our photographers, in our schools and museums. They've been locked away in physical form, unseen for decades. We are reclaiming the Black narrative, sharing the images of our culture captured by those who live the experience. Our team works with students, interns, and fellows to digitize this history and share it with younger generations. Some of our images will be used to support the study of artificial intelligence. They will aid in the perfection of an emerging technology that impacts our daily lives. These images tell stories of our laughter and our lives. We're preparing our history for the metaverse. Some of our images will be converted into NFTs. This practice allows current generations and future generations a chance to own replicas of their own past. Our most important leaders of yesterday will live in the virtual worlds of tomorrow. It's an awesome task. We've grown rapidly in a few short years. We needed a new physical home, so we bought a house. Obsidian House is a historic mansion on Chicago's South Side in an iconic neighborhood called Bronzeville. We're renovating this magnificent building to be a museum, library, work share space, and digitizing center. It's all about us telling our stories the way we see ourselves, the real Black Chicago, in the wonderful Windy City. There are a lot of Black stories to be told. We're just getting started. This might seem like a really obvious question, but I'll ask it anyway, because I know you got something to say <laughs> about it. Um, what is it that is so important about images that help us see ourselves differently? And why is that so important in changing the narrative about black people? You know, um, it's a great question. I'm, I'm really honored to share the stage with these important storytellers, and I want to use what they shared so far to illuminate that point. The, the people in this room had the fortune to hear two amazing perspectives of our black history. And, and what's important is that we digitize that so that everyone can hear those stories. It's, um, my, my journey started, I was, I was looking for, um, well, born and raised in Chicago on the South Side, still live on the South Side. We had this really weird guy become mayor and change the whole narrative. So I grew up in a wonderful, residential, everybody owned, totally black neighborhood. I had an amazing childhood. I'm, I live in a building now that's been owned by my family for 70 years. I'm drinking the same cup of coffee and the entire narrative of Chicago changed. Like, wait, what? You know, I'm watching the news and they're just describing it. I'm like, that place looks horrible. Oh, they're talking about my neighborhood. Oh, that was interesting. You know, and, and so my, my life didn't change, but the complete narrative of my people and my community did in, I would say, the last 10 years. And, and there was always, you know, we had, we had our Al Capone and then we have now. You know, we didn't have all of this in between, but... The, so I started just telling people in my community our story that I had lived. And if you talk to young people, and I'm, I'm sure everybody here, uh, many people know, that 91% of the information received by young people is digital. So I'm talking to my son and all of his young friends about black Chicago that I knew from the 70s. And then they immediately start going to their phone and I'm like, why are you going to your phone? I'm, and they're like, well, none of that is in here. And I said, well, well I'm telling you. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. 
but it's not in here. So is it really true? I mean, you know, how is that? I mean, because it's not in the phone. And then I realized, oh, we, we as a community, as a culture, had not been aggressively digitizing our information because I was born before all of this. And so when it all was invented, I kind of assumed it was all in there. And it wasn't in there. And so um, my, my mother was the last elder in my family, because one of those images of that real old black family, that's my family. I, I, I know my family from back to 1875. So that was a picture from 1921. But I said, oh, I should go to the Chicago Defender and get some cleaner images. My grandmother had a charm school in the 50s. She was always in the paper. So I'm thinking, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to type in her name. I'm going to pay some money. That's fine. I bring some cash. And they're like, and, and, and a colleague of mine said, oh, the Chicago Defender uh, images are disintegrating. And I said, well, that's not true. Don't, don't say stuff like that. That's just that's, that's how rumors get started. And she said, so I'm a professional archivist <laughs> with a master's degree in archiving, and the images are disintegrating. Le gasp. So I, I said, oh, l let me raise some funding. And, and so some of my uh, funders are in here. I didn't understand how philanthropy worked. I went, I'm going to need money to save the Chicago Defender Archives. Um, and they were like, well, let's meet and talk. No, 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 there's no time for all of that. <laughs> I'm going to need money. Listen, I don't want to be unreasonable. I'll come down Friday. I mean, today is Monday. <laughs> I'm good. And, 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 and my first donor was like, she was so patient because it just doesn't go like that. But um, <laughs> so, so because I had a nonprofit because I'm, bi I'm a cyclist and I was, we were giving away bicycles. So I had a 501c3. And I was like, I, here's the name and the address. Done. <laughs> so we went through all that. And the Chicago Defender Archives, um, they thought they only had about 10,000 images in the room because the, the, the paper had sold from the original family and the family took the lion's share of the photographs. So they, if you've ever seen the TV show Hoarders, the room looked like that. It was like, you know how you just push everything in there and get the door closed. So when we went in, we thought, they thought, you only find about 10,000 images and much to your experience, not nearly as profound, but we found a quarter of a million images in that room. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, it was the ancestors saying, hey, we've been here the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, you cannot see a quarter of a million images of yourself at once and ever be the same. Because that, this was not my journey at all. But when I say we were gorgeous, mm -hmm. good grief. We were gorgeous. And we kept thinking, well, what is this, a prom? What is this, a formal dance? What is this, an inauguration? And this was just ladies Church. having lunch. Yeah. <laughs> this was just people having a meeting yeah, with, yeah. with muffs. And I mean, you know, I just didn't look that good on my wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I went to tell everybody about it, um, it was like, oh, you've got to see this. You've got to see this. And, and then it's th that started the formation of the Obsidian Collection, that we have to digitize black history. And so that all of our journalists, all of our writers, one thing that happened while we were cleaning up the Defender Archives, because it took a year. Because I went in there with the arrogance of, I know how to clean a house. I mean, how, how hard can it be? <laughs> but then you pick up every thing and put it in a piece of mylar and put it over. Oh my God, it was a year. So the, at the same time, the woman who had told the Emmett Till story had recanted. Now the, def the Chicago Defender was one of the very few black newspapers that had sent reporters down there. And when we had pulled out this file cabinet that had rusted and fallen apart, because I told I have a colleague, I've been an entrepreneur for 30 years, so I have a colleague that's been by my side for most of that time. And she said, what are we doing? I said, girl, we archivists now, you know, because we're going to do, we doing this. And so when we were pulling, and, and when we opened the door, and when they said, I said, there's something moving there. <laughs> Black history might be lost. <laughs> I'm a bit of a prude, but 
we, um, <laughs> we pulled out a file cabinet and out came a, about 100 images that were stuck in the back in the corners of a file cabinet that were in plastic. You know, if you remember the old 70s thick plastic from Walgreens, but they had curled because they had frozen that position. It was 100 images from the Emmett Till funeral. Mm. And, and I recognized, I said, I think this is the Emmett Till funeral. So fortunately, and this woman has since passed away, but she was my age, she was a cousin. She got the whole family together because there were two factions of the Emmett Till family. My, my mother and father went to school with Mamie Till, so I knew a little bit of this. But there was the, the northern faction of the family and the southern faction, and they never were on the same page through the journey. But we got the northern family together, and they identified, and there were tears, and it was because nobody had seen these images. And then people started calling from around the world, because people under 50, had never seen the images, wanted to tell this story. So we started manually, okay, you mail a check, you FedEx this. We started doing this licensing and permissions, kind of making it up, you know, reading old forms and things like that. So we had to form the Obsidian Collection to not only get out these stories, but all of those beautiful stories. And I think about all of your, your dives, who doesn't go to the museum and have a whole religious experience? You know, um, but imagine everyone around the world being able to go to a black portal and pull up all of this information and tell these stories. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think you might have answered my <laughs> next question, um, but I'll ask it anyway in case you have something different to say. Has there been anything that has surprised you about what you found? Is there an impact story? You just told an impact story, but like. I've got a million of them. Okay, I can, tell us one I more can impact story. One more, because okay. I can clear a cocktail party. It's like, look, good Lord, she's still over there <laughs> telling these stories. But. One that really moved me that I had to ask my elders, because I've got some, you know, surviving aunts and uncles, like, is this, is this true? And, and many people may know, but did you know, no, that in, uh, I'm, I'm pretty political for a lot of reasons, but in 1972, we had the Black National Convention. How many of you knew that? Yep, Gary and Nana. Okay, see, there's two hands in the whole audience. See, that's important. Now, three. In 1972, did you say you know? Gary, Indiana. Yes, in Gary, Indiana. 10,000 black people went to Gary, Indiana, because that was the city that had the black mayor, and, um, and had their own national convention. I've got the photos with the signs of every single state. There were agendas, there were platforms, and I'm blown away by that, and I was telling a journalistic friend of mine, because she calls me every Black History Month, like, girl, what's my story? And then I tell her a story, and then that, that's her story uh, for, uh, it was on WGN. So she did, she did some investigative journalism, because she's young, so she had not heard that story. But then she found uh, a 12-year-old a girl, who, the, oh, she was 12 in 1972, now she's grown, and they had film footage of it. And she told this wonderfully elaborate story, and so I'm now seeing film footage when I had just seen pictures. So what the Obsidian Collection Archives is doing is getting all of the facts together so that the stories can be told. I think it's analogous to uh, rap music. I know I'm, you're gonna think I'm like, she can't be that old, but she is. I was in high school when Rapper's Delight came out. <laughs> Listen, that was everything. We knew every single word to Rapper's Delight. That's the first rap album song, modern rap, but what we define as modern rap. I thought rap could not get better than this. This is the best thing that has ever happened. We sang it all together all the time. Then the next generation said, hold my soda pop. Mm. Then they elevated it. Then the next generation said, wait, hold on, we got some more. And so I've watched it evolve into this whole hip hop culture 
that I could have never, ever, ever imagined. And then I travel the world a lot, and my son lived in uh, South Korea for a while, and I was like, is, is that rap? Because they would sing the hooks in English and then rap the lyrics in their native language. And I say that to say what the Obsidian, Ar what the Obsidian Collection Archives is doing is we're just gonna get all of this information together because these young people will tell incredible stories and they will amaze, and, and, and my team is young, and they constantly amaze me with their ideas, with these new technologies, you know, these new apps, good grief. But I just wanna get this stuff together and let them go forward to disseminate the information. Got it. Well, we can use it on the searchable museum at our museum. See, look at we bought the connections. I love it. I love it. Plug, but it's true. That's I'm what's up. We have a new digital humanities platform called the Searchable Museum. You can go to the searchablemuseum.com. But resources like this are extremely important because while we are also doing digitization, all of these add up, and it enables us to, you know, secure permission to use some of those right. images on our platform. Yeah. And so to have that out there is extremely important to us. We've got more, I've got more lawyers than friends. <laughs> and I've got a lot of friends. So And that, you're saying that to a lawyer. See, see, listen, because I'm telling them now, ain't I a de facto lawyer? I mean, just after you read all of these agreements and understand all of this stuff, I was like, can I pass the bar? And they're like, no. I'm like. <laughs> I sure feel like I can, but that, I think that's, that's so important because we are uh, branching out to London this October. And when we go into other, the, the black diaspora, we have to respectfully go into other communities. And so we're doing a, a, a conversation on Windrush, which is a word I had only heard in 2022. But now I can clear a cocktail party with that too. So it's just a lot of stories to be told. Got it. Well, you yeah. will have to tell me what Windrush is because I don't know. But don't tell me now. I'll we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Like, and then 25 <laughs> minutes later. Yeah. There. <laughs> yes. We're out of time, but I just okay. want to ask one last question. And if we'll do round robin, you could answer in like 10 to 15 seconds. Here's an audience of impact funders. What do you want to say to them about changing? how they can help support changing the narrative of blackness and how they might support your work. So I'll just say really quick, you asked that question about um, the transatlantic slave trade and what we gave up. And what's important is what you're giving for projects like this to help bring the story in to a more, be more inclusive. And so there's a statement we open in the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition. It's a quote from, it's an excerpt from, a, um, from a, an abolitionist document. And it says, I, I must admit I am sickened by the purchase of slaves, but I must be mum for how would we do without sugar or rum. And so what is given up is our morality. And what is very important is what are we willing to give up to give up our morality, to have that almighty thing at the cost of other people, and what do we owe one another? And so I can't thank you enough for supporting projects like the Obsidian, projects like our museum, and other projects, because these stories have to be told so we can get back in touch with our humanity. Beautiful. I'll just add real quickly, the quickest way you can support is go to diamondwithapurpose.org and click the donate button. <laughs> 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 But uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to queue up young people to do this work. And uh, most of our, practically all of our offerings to young people, they, they pay absolutely nothing. Uh, adults, knuckleheads, they have to pay. <laughs> but young folks, we're trying to do it, trying to support them to be able to have access to this information. So you can support us in that way. And we also need expertise in a lot of different areas. So I encourage you to go to our site. And uh, we, we list out a few things where we can need some help in ATE and lawyers, <laughs> uh, we need an agent, and so forth and so on. So please visit our site, divingwiththepurpose.org. For us, it, w it would really be the funding. I think at, at, at the first, at the top of the morning, uh, the lady on the screen said it really well. Sometimes these um, storytelling grants are written based on, well, what story are you getting ready to tell? And then we don't fit into that box, so we have a hard time even connecting with people because it's so, it's written from that, well, how many journalists are you going to actually employ? And it's like, ah, so, okay, well, you know, and so, so we're building the platform 
that uh, allows for black media to thrive, but not in these traditional boxes that the funding is written. I, I, I just heard uh, Daniel Ash speak, and he's, he's one of our champions. He listened to me fuss and rant for a whole 40 minutes and then stopped. I mean, I stopped. And I said, are you listening? And he was like, yeah, I just was hoping you'd stop. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and then it's become one of our donors. That, see, that was in an hour was, and 15 minutes, right? Got it. <laughs> 15 seconds. Thank you, guys. It's a beautiful uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's much.